Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and PJ, Peter Joseph, and all of you that have worked so hard to make this meeting possible. And of course, during the question period, don't be polite. If there's anything I say that you don't understand, question it. And if you ask me a question, if I fail to answer it, say, you didn't answer my question. So don't be polite. In order to learn new things, you have to learn how to think differently. I want to tell you that, first of all, there are major problems in the world today, other than my hearing aids. I want to say that the language that we use today was designed hundreds of years ago. The language all over the world is very old. That makes it almost impossible to talk to one another. What we do is we talk at each other. Now, let me tell you what that means. Sometimes we say, well, have a nice weekend. Why don't we say, have a nice life? Why just the weekend? In other words, the language is automatic. How are you? How's the family? They don't really give a damn about your family. Tell them you need $3,000 for an operation. Gosh, that you can't have it for me. Then why do you ask me how I am? <laughs> so the world you live in is full of shit as a Christmas turkey. <laughs> so what I want to try to get across to you is we need a language that's not subject to interpretation. When you read the Bible, that is the Christian Bible, or any Bible, when you read it, it's subject to interpretation. People say, I think Jesus meant this. Oh no, he meant that. You're both wrong, he meant this. So the Bible itself generates the Seventh-day Adventist, the Christian, the Catholic. You have all kinds of different denominations because people don't have a common agreement. Now the question that comes up, is it possible to develop a language that's not subject to interpretation. Mathematics, chemistry, engineering. When engineers talk to each other, they don't say, believe me, this is very strong. They give you its tensile strength, its compression strength, its torsional strength in numbers. And when chemists write a formula, if you send it to Japan or any country in the world, they interpret it the same way. So I'm just trying to tell you it is possible to develop a language that's not subject to interpretation. Not only that, when you talk to other people today, they walk away and they say, they tell somebody else what they think you mean. Because the language is not that precise. And a lot of people get into wars and arguments, although they would agree on the same thing, but the language doesn't register that way. Well, when you come to think of it, Think of the world you live in. The world you live in today is a monetary world based on money. Money produces incentive. It also produces corruption, embezzlement, paying off senators. I want to try to tell you this, that all nations are basically corrupt. All of them. Politicians say things people like to hear. I'm not up here to win your approval. I'm up here to tell you what I think will work, do away with war, poverty, hunger, unemployment. All the problems we have today are technical. They're not political. If you don't understand me, ask any politician you know or believe in, how would you stop cars from hitting each other? Well, I don't know. How can you grow more food for people all over the world? They don't know. How can you clean the dust out of the atmosphere? They don't know. Really, they don't know anything. They are just people, businessmen, and lawyers. Now, there's nothing the matter with a lawyer as long as he keeps his hands in his own pockets. So, the world you live in is a world where we're predatory over one another. If you need a root canal job, somebody makes thousands of dollars. If somebody dents your car, somebody makes a lot of money. So if you need eyeglasses, another guy makes money. So everybody makes money on human misery. How many of you knew that there's a metal with a memory? Will you raise your hands? How many of you knew that there's a new surgical material? It's used for sutures, for sewing up sti or stitching the body. That has a memory. And the doctor takes that material and he ties a surgical knot 
Then he straightens it out and he sticks it through your skin. First he cuts it. And the heat of the body causes it to tie a surgical knot. Isn't that fantastic? That exists. Those of you that would like to see that medal, uh, well, maybe I'll make it available tomorrow for some of you that want to get together. I'll show you how it works and how it behaves itself. That means if you made a chair, contour chair, for the human body, contour, not designed by an artist, designed by an anatomist, and then you flatten that chair out, and you ship 10,000 chairs to China flat, connect two electrodes, they move back into the shape. That means you can design buildings with memory materials all through it, and then when you make a dome-shaped building or any shape building, you flatten it out, ship thousands of houses to India, and when you connect two electrodes, it takes a minute and a half, becomes a full-size building. This business of men training to use plaster, hammer and nails like Jimmy Carter, is a jackass. He's way behind the times. So I'm trying to tell you today, we have the technology to wipe out poverty, give medical care to everybody on Earth, if the nations join together. As long as they remain separate, as long as few nations control most of the world's resources, you're going to have territorial disputes, arguments, poverty, unemployment, the same story over and over again. People are not educated in university today. Universities today have the best equipment, scientific equipment, mathematics. They have equipment to measure the strains of all kinds of materials. What's happening? The wars are getting worse. The old atom bomb, today, they're a thousand times stronger than the atom bomb. Now, what can you accomplish with that? So I'm trying to tell you that the military is comprised of extremely stupid people also because they don't know how to solve problems. They use bombers. Remember this. It isn't machines that kill people. It's men that fly over cities that press a button and drop an atom bomb. Even a guided missile is guided by people. And man puts himself on a pedestal. He says he's the greatest creation of nature. He's the guy that pollutes the oceans, the air, that kills other people in the name of God if their God is different than my God. Boom, we get rid of the guy. So here you have human beings that say they're the greatest achievement in nature. Only the next few years will determine that. U.S. has 300 submarines. Each one has more destructive power than all the wars in history. Now what can you accomplish with that? Now, the American senators and congressmen voted on a support system under a mountain where they can all go and live for six months. It provides food, oxygen, everything. What do you come out to? A burnt-out, radioactive world? That's what I mean by the government agents and government people are not technical. The problems today are technical, not political. A thousand years ago or a hundred years ago, Politics was just borderline. Today it's no longer necessary. Again, don't take my word for it. Ask politicians how to solve problems. How do you bridge the difference between nations? Well, we don't know how to do that. That's why we keep armies, to keep them from invading us. Well, you invaded everybody else. Where did you think you got America from? You took it from the Indians. And then you took Spain. You took from Spain, you took California and New Mexico from Mexico by killing people. The same with the British, the same with the Polish, the same with all nations. They kill and take land away from others. We don't go to other countries to bring them democracy. That's the crap they give you. We go there because they have oil or something we need. If you want a world without war, without poverty, without hunger or unemployment or abuse of any other human being, this is what the Venus Project has to offer. So in simplifying this, we can open this portion to questions, which I'm sure a lot of you have. I will try to answer the questions for you. What we want to do is build a global resource-based economy where resources are available to everyone. What I want to make sure you understand is what a resource-based economy is. It means that the world has enough resources 
to feed, clothes, house everybody, build hospitals for everybody, more than enough. I'm not talking about a handout society that lives in poverty, although it's all joined together. I'm talking about a very high standard of living. If you don't understand that, the middle class American lives better than kings. He has television in his car, he has cell phones. No king ever had that. He had horse and wagon, he'd go over a bumpy road and he couldn't heat the castle, it was so big, most of the heat rose and they froze and they were very uncomfortable. So if the middle class today lives better than kings, with the future and the new technologies, particularly nanotechnology, where in the next 15 years, not according to me, according to nanotechnologists, they say they'll be able to arrange atoms in whatever molecular structure they want. That means they'll be able to make gold, all kinds of minerals, materials, meat, tissue, plants, without growing food. The future is a fantastic place if we turn science loose. That means today you try to dig up nickels and dimes for heart disease, cystic fibrosis, the starving Africans. That's a long way to go. We can easily provide for the needs of all people. If you don't understand that, consider World War II. We bombed England, Germany bombed England flat. France was bombed to rubble. And they gave soldiers whatever they needed, machine guns, airplanes, submarines. They cost billions of dollars. Why don't they do that during peace? Because they like things to wear out, break down. The army, the army itself is corrupt in the sense that they, when they conscript the lives of young men, that is putting up your life to defend your country, they should conscript all the war industries so no one makes a buck out of war. Do you understand that? The same basis of pay as the armed services. After the war, give them back to factories. If you took the profit out of war, there'd be no war. War is the biggest scandal, this business of human corruption in the world. It's always been that. And the Holy Bible says, There'll always be war and rumors of war. And we shall always have the poor amongst us. I can't accept that garbage. I think that we have the technology to solve all kinds of problems. When we put to science, we want an atom bomb, they develop an atom bomb. The trouble with scientists is they're controlled by different nations. And the scientists of Germany fell in line with Hitler. The scientists of Italy fell in line with the Italian government, and the scientists of America fell in line. So today you really don't have any scientists. You have specialists in chemistry, physics, botany. In the future, we will never generate a person of a single profession proficiency. What we will do is create in schools generalists, so people understand anthropology, sociology, the history of civilization, so they'll understand these things. They cannot be used to make weapons of destruction. The kids will be educated, brought up with all kinds of people. It's, it's the parents that get to the kids and say, you're a Catholic, you don't play with that little Lutheran boy. Or you're an Indian and you don't play, you have no respect for that country. Or you're Irish and the Irish are the greatest people in the world. That separates people. If parents raise, raise children to their limited knowledge, you're hurting the children of the future. So in the future, somebody asked me, who will make the decisions as to who raises children? First kind of books you want to read is what made Leonardo da Vinci? What is creativity? Well, you ask any creative person, say, what is creativity? They usually don't know. And even if they're inventors, and they've invented a lot of things, they say, how do you invent? I don't know, it just comes to me. So they think it's natural. They think there's such a thing as human nature. That's what most people believe all over the world, that some people are lazy, some are hardworking, some are honest, some are dishonest. All that is bullshit, lies. It depends on where you're coming from. If you were raised in ancient Rome, when they used to feed Christians to lions, that was normal to that culture. So the whole family would come to see Christians being fed the lions. And the kids would say, Daddy, can I come next week to see Christians fed the lions? And Daddy would say, if you behave yourself. <laughs> so you see, are they insane? No. 
if you were raised by the headhunters of the Amazon as a baby, never saw anything else, you'd be a headhunter. If you were raised in Nazi Germany as a baby, Heil Hitler, you'd be a Nazi. So people are not good or bad. It depends on where they're coming from. Assuming you were raised as a headhunter, if I went into your hut and I said, doesn't it bother you to have six shrunken heads there? He says, yes. My brother has 20. <laughs> Is he bad? No. He was brought up in that culture. If you were brought up in the, way back in the Middle Ages in Salem, Massachusetts, way back then, they used to burn women, and very few men, but mostly women, had had ideas of their own. They would burn burnt alive because they were told they were satanic or witches. This is Salem, Massachusetts in the United States a short time ago. Why did they do that? For every witch you found, you inherited their bank account and their property. Did you know that? No, it's not in your history books. So they keep things out of your history books. They do not teach people at universities to think. They teach them to be a cog in the wheel, a doctor, a lawyer, a biologist, a physicist, a chemist, an anthropologist, but they don't teach you how to think. So once they do that, you're under that control and under that influence. Someday, all children will be raised in a mixed environment. So children have no bad attitude. Children will even reach for a rattlesnake. They have no attitude until you start saying, you're Irish, you don't play with that Greek boy. It's when you go to work and poison your kids. So somebody said to me, who will raise the children in the future? People that understand what shapes human values. Parents would have to go to school to learn how to raise children. I'll give you one idea of that, how it works. I never taught my little boy how to read when he was four or five years old. Way before that, when he was two years old, I used to read to him. Then I'd close the book at the most interesting part at night when he was in bed. He said, Daddy, but what happened then? I said, well, look, if you learn to read, you can find out for yourself. <laughs> uh, give them a reason to want to read. Don't teach them to read. Don't teach them that two and two is four, because it's four what? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. And when you use this on children, if you tell them to spell cat with a C-A-T, and they spell it with a K-A-T, don't say that's wrong. Just say you're very close. We just changed this the K into a C. But if you say, that's wrong, now you have to think about that. What does that tell anybody, that's wrong? It doesn't tell you a damn thing. If you say to a kid, that's not what I told you, that doesn't tell them anything. But if you say, if you take the K away and put a C there, it's, it's closer to the way we want you to write. But if the key comes back with a C facing the wrong way, don't say it's wrong. Just say, you're getting much closer. Turn the C around. So we don't even know how to educate people. We condemn people. We give them grades in school. He gets a passing grade, you fail. He says, I, I'm better than you. And you make jealousy and envy. Whenever you have two children, if you pick up the young one and play with it, say young one, say two, three years old, and the old one's six or seven, he's standing there with that lower lip out. Like that. You're making jealousy and envy. So you always take the young kid, put it on your lap, and the older kid, and never pit them against each other. Never say, why can't you be like your sister? She puts everything away, and you leave everything all around, and I have to pick up after you. Then when your sister falls down the stairs, you got a grin on your face. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you the, the world is unsane, not insane. Unsane means you're brought up with false values. They think that all Irishmen are drunkards. And if you want to clean out your cell, you get a big, dumb Polak. And they got that something about everybody. Nasty. So years ago, I said to myself, Jack, if you want to design a new world, how are you going to change people? They all have different concepts of God. They have different concepts of conduct. And they're all very different in their values. How are you going to reach them? And I said, I don't know. That's the first thing you have to learn how to say in science. I don't know. That's very hard for people to say, because you give everybody a right to their own opinion. 
Well, if a girl lives across the way from me and ten guys come out of her apartment, I can have all kinds of opinions. She could be a language instructor, a ballet instructor, but if you give everybody a right to their own opinion, say, you think we'll ever get to the moon? Nah, not in a thousand years. Just say, I don't know. I don't know anything about rockets. I know nothing about space travel. I can't answer that question. You give people a right to their own opinion, you think man can fly? Nah. If the Lord wanted man to fly, he'd have been born with wings. Well, if the Lord wanted you to wear clothing, you'd have been born with a suit. <laughs> so years ago, I wanted to know what people would be like if they were brought up in a primitive environment. So I worked my way on a banana boat to a set of islands called Tuamotu. And when I got there, everybody walked around naked. And I never saw a male stare at a female body. They've been swimming nude ever since they were little. So a nude woman didn't mean anything. They only looked at the eyes of a girl. They never say, hey, fellas, get a load of that chick. That's what you get in a civilized world, which is artificial. You have to think about that now. Think about it. There was no peeping toms on the island, because girls and boys walked around nude. If they had to piss, they went off in the woods and pissed. And nobody ever became a peeping tom. There were no fetishes, meaning no tit men, leg men, ass men, or long hair men that like different aspects. It's when you hide, if you hide a girl's nose, you say to the guy, did you ever see a girl's nose? No, show him a little bit, have to loosen his collar. <laughs> if you bring him up to that. So we are made the way we are. We don't have our own minds. When you're very young, your mother pumps. Who loves you more than anybody in the world? I don't know, your mommy and daddy. Okay. What's the greatest country? Oh, I don't know. India, Spain, France. They pump all that shit in your head, and then you think you're free. You think you're making your own decisions. You don't. So I did a lecture at Princeton University, and the subject matter scared everybody. It was called Man Cannot Think or Reason. Now, that made everybody angry, and they all wanted to come to discredit me, of course. And... Uh, a guy from the optics department said, I don't agree with you. I think man can think and reason. I says, give me one example. He said, there are many examples. I says, I can't do anything with that. Give me one example. So he said, well, somebody had to invent the camera. He had to think of it. There was no camera around. Well, let me try to describe that to you. If you go into a barn in the daytime, it's very dark. If there's a knot hole in the barn, that is where light can come in, you will see cows walking upside down on the wall in your barn. A thousand years ago in the Holy Land, if a guy lived in a clay hut and he had a little hole in, you'd see people, if the sun was out, walking upside down on the wall. And he charged two pieces of silver to see the upside down world. That's where the camera came from. Light coming into a dark area from a little hole. I said, well, the guy got mad at me. He said, what about uh, moving pictures? There's no moving picture out there. Where did the guy get the idea? The Chinese used to carve a girl out of either wood or laminated paper with hands up like that. This is 1,500 years ago. And then they take that little statue and put a candle in front of it and oil paper behind her. As the candle flickered, the girl danced. You understand that? It was a silhouette. The candle flickers as it burned, and it looked like the girl was dancing. That was the first motion picture. Then the Chinese took a lot of paper and made up a pad, and they tied it together. And they made, they marked the corner so you know what number and what sequence was in that pad. But if you happen to flip it fast, that pad number jumped all over the paper. When you make a mark in the corner of a bunch of little pieces of paper bound together and flip it fast, that mark will jump around. A Chinese artist drew a bird's wings here, 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 and there. And he drew it in the corner of the page. And when you flip it fast, it looked like the bird was flying. That was 1,500 years ago. And the Chinese didn't sit down and invent them, those moving pictures. They encountered them by accident. A Frenchman saw that in a Chinese museum, and he machined it out of brass 
did a beautiful job, and he put all the pictures in a circle, and he turned the crank, and the bird flew very well. But occasionally, the wings would stop, and he found out he had to hold his finger there and let the pictures go by, but stop for a short distance, for a short time, so the eye can pick up the image. Once that was developed, the Frenchman copied that, put it in a circle, put more pictures there, and turned the crank, and he had a beautiful shot of the waves of the sea moving like that, and a man walking. Edison bought that from a Frenchman. Edison did not invent the movie camera. Nobody ever invented anything. It's happened so slowly. Like I tried to tell you before, language. They say language was invented to communicate. That's a lie. Somebody banged his elbow once and went, ah. He banged his wing, ooh. He ate something good, mmm. And that's where language came from. <laughs> Sounds people made in relation to different events. The human brain, if you're born with a better brain than anybody else, better brain tissue, more neurotransmitters, you become ignorant faster if you associate with ignorant people. <laughs> the brain has no mechanism for deciphering that which makes sense and doesn't. You have to have experience. If you still don't understand me, if you smell a rose and you enjoy it, and years later you go to another place, another country, say like Madagascar, and you see a rose with black dots on it, you tend to smell it. But if it burns your eyes and your nose for a week and a half, the next flower you see, you go <laughs> So this is how you learn. And nobody, this is really harder to understand, Nobody ever makes a mistake in their life. Nobody. Now, let me try to answer that. In France, long before the Wright brothers, a guy built two sets of wings. They were only three feet long, and he jumped off the Eiffel Tower, and he died. And his brother-in-law wrote, make wings larger next time. <laughs> There's no other way to know. Nobody makes a mistake. The first man that mixed nitric acid and glycerin together. The building disappeared, so did the guy. His brother-in-law wrote, never fool with that stuff. Man never makes a mistake. He doesn't know. How can he know how to build a flying machine? Unless he encounters that it won't get off the ground if the wings are too short, so he makes them larger. And that's the story of all invention. I asked an Indian, who invented the bow and arrow? Well, he said his great-grandfather told him that the Indians used to tie skins. They'd skin an animal, put it out in the sun, and it would shrink, and they didn't like that. So they tied the skin to a frame. But what they tied it with was a leather, leather strip. So when you cut a leather strip, put it out in the sun, it shrinks. It goes fatter and shorter. So he tied it to a stick, but the stick wasn't thick enough, and the leather shrunk and he got the bow. You understand what I'm talking about? Nobody ever sat down and invented the bow and bow and arrow. It was discovered. All ideas. So another guy from the electrical engineering department got up and said, what about Tesla? He invented the wireless. The brain can't invent anything. Here's where Tesla got the wireless from. When you bought wire in the old days, they wrapped it around a cardboard tube. But sometimes the wire was broken so they connected two electrodes from a battery to make sure the wire wasn't broken. When you bought thinner wire, they wrapped around a small coil. If he put that in the package when you went out of the electric store, if you checked the wiring, it induced the current in the one that wasn't connected. And the guy was just as surprised as anybody. And that's where Tesla got it from. Man cannot invent anything. The bird suggests a flying machine. The Wright brothers didn't sit down and invent the flying machine. They made little gliders with feathers, and they didn't work too well. And then they killed a pigeon and put wires in its wings and moved the wings forward and backward till they found the balance point. That was really where they get the information. There's not a single thing that you can think of that wasn't invented serially, little by little, until it becomes computers. And people say, gee, I can't even think of anything like that. That's because you don't understand that nobody invents anything. Somebody invents a little thing, and they add to that, and it grows. The same with language and knowledge. Without experience, 
darkness, no knowledge. The schools of the future will never give children grades because that produces bad feelings. They will say, never use words like it's wrong, but they'll show them the approach to make it correct. So what is science? Science is based upon the ability first to say, I don't know. When the government approached scientists and said, we'd like to put a man on the moon, can you do it? They said, we don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You know, well, we don't know what a man can stand. The government says, I still don't know what you mean. We have to put a guy in a centrifuge and whirl him around, and if he conks out at 7 or 10 Gs, 10 times gravity, we know that we can't take off at 50 Gs. Everybody would die. That's where they get their information, whirling a guy around. And if he survives, they know what speed to take off. Now, how do you feed a guy in a spaceship? You give him a glass of water. If you pull the glass away, the water will stay there in space, then become little bubbles and fill the spaceship. So they put water in a tube and you squeeze it. You can't know that until you get out into space. If you live out in space, say for three or four months or six months, calcium in your bones begin to disappear. You won't know that until somebody's been out there and you come back and you check them out. So science is the ability to check out things. Religion makes assumptions that somebody up in the clouds made a man and a woman. And, he's, and he had a snake, of course, he made that too, that walked upright. And the snake came over to Adam and Eve and said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree. And they said, which tree is that? You know, and they, he pointed out. And of course they ate because they were curious. And then he kicked them out of heaven. Is this God or a jerk? <laughs> I once asked Einstein, whether he believed in God, he said, which one? <laughs> you know, in the old days, they used to think there's 40 gods, the god of love, the god of agriculture, the god of battle, war. You know, in the Viking books, it says, you can't get into heaven unless you die in battle. That's a hell of a good technique. <laughs> think about it. So the world you live in, I'm trying to tell you this, is full of shit. It is baseless. It's stupidity which you put in high places because the guy has gray hair or he looks dignified or he's got a dog on his lap. There are no good dogs and no bad dogs. I used to train dogs to lead the blind. When I was a kid, they used to walk with a stick. So I trained dogs to lead the blind and a sweet old lady came over and said, what a nice dog. I said, no, I could have trained that dog to tear soldiers to pieces. There's no good or bad dog. It depends on the way you bring them up. Do you understand that? Same with children, same with thieves, serial killers. They're all made by different aspects of the environment. There are no prisons in the future, no police, no armies, no navies, if you understand what I'm talking about. So when you leave here, you should be a little different than the way you came in. And if you don't talk to other people about the Venus Project, I can assure you nothing will happen. We'll probably continue to pollute the air, the earth, and have wars. So if you want to change society, go to work on your friends, have meetings, talk about it. That's what the Zeitgeist Movement's about. Getting there and talking about people, how we get to be the way we are, how to make the world a better place, and how to bridge the difference between nations. Well, as a kid, I said, Jock, how are you going to bridge the difference? These people are so different. So I joined the Ku Klux Klan and I dissolved it in a month and a half. Then I joined the White Citizens Council. They hate foreigners, blacks, orientals, almost everybody. I dissolved it in one month. Then when I got back to New York, I said, what are the most backward people in the New York area? And they said, the Arabs that live on Atlantic Avenue. I said, what makes you think they're backward? Well, they still believe the Earth is flat. So I said, uh, I've got to change them. If I want to change the world, I've got to be able to change them. So I got in touch with the Arab in charge of that group. His name was Elbaz. And I called him on the phone and I said, Elbaz, can I come and talk to you? He said, you are Arab? That's the way he spoke. I said, eh, that means yes in Arabic. I speak a little bit of different languages. So he said, from where your father he born? I said, Lebanon. He said, very good, come and saw me. He's come and see me. So I came to see him, and he said to me, 
You believe the word he loaned? I said, yes. So he held his hands up like this. He said, he pointed to his head first to show how smart he was. Then he came back and he said, if the world he loaned, man fall me down here. <laughs> All the water he fall me down from the world. Cannot be round. Has to be flat. So I said, boy, if I can't change him, how, how am I going to change the world? So I gave him a balloon which I brought with me and I told him to hold the balloon and I rubbed it with fur. And I put cornflakes in his hand and told him to hand, hold his hand far away from the balloon, about that distance. And when I rubbed the balloon, all the cornflakes jumped up to the balloon. And he looked at it and his jaw hit the paper. He said, world he magnet? I said, eh, ah. <laughs> and he explained that to all the other Arabs. It took an hour and a half to turn him around. I brought a Japanese kid home one day, and my mother said, I don't want that kind around. My mother was brought up that way, of course. I used reason with her. She said, I still don't want that kind around. So I said, boy, if you can't get to your mother, Jock, you can't change the world. So I said, well, how can I get to my mother? And I tried certain systems, and one worked. I said, I was swimming in the East River, mother, and there was no way to get ashore. There's a high wall, and Masato, this isn't true, by the way, Masato worked on a boat, and he threw a life raft to me. So I said, if it wasn't for Masato, I'd be dead. She says, oh, my God. She says, I heard it feeling, didn't I? I said, yes, you did. She said, please ask him to come back. I want to beg and apologize. So I said, Mother, I don't know if he'll come back now. So get her to plead with me. She kept pleading, please, ask him to come back. I said, all right. I called Masato, and I told him the lie I told my mother. I said, the minute you walk in the door, she's going to hug you, God bless you, and all that sort of thing. And she did that. At the dinner table, she was talking to him. So I walked out. When Masada went to the washroom, I came back and said, Mother, what do you think? She said, you know, he's just like you and I. He's a decent human being with a nice family. And I said, yeah, but he's a member of the yellow race. She said, that's got nothing to do with it. He's a nice boy. And then a month later, she puts her arm around the saddle and calls him son, because she really got to like him. Then I told her that he never saved my life. She says, you little devil, I would have never opened the door. <laughs> so sometimes reason and logic doesn't work. I'm trying to tell you the world you live in is very sick. And if you don't go to work on people and teach them that there's no such thing, as Italian blood and Greek blood and French blood and Indian blood. There's certain blood types. Sometimes your own kid can't give you a transfusion. So all human beings need clean air, clean water, good food, a relevant education. We all need the same thing. But when you start dividing people, the Arabs are dumb and the Germans are militaristic. They're militaristic if they're brought up in a militaristic environment. So I'm trying to tell you that environment basically shapes behavior. Genetics shapes your nose, the color of your eyes, the shape of your ears. And sometimes when something goes wrong with the genes, you're born with two heads or six arms. You know, that's genetic. But your values, your attitude about life and the world is learned. That's not inherited. People do not inherit evil. They do not inherit killing ability to want to be a serial killer. That is done by either brain damage due to a disease or the fact that they've been mistreated as a kid. If a young girl, parents far fight all the time and father beats mother, that girl might go up and say, boy, I'm never getting married. That's her experience. So people get different types of environments that they're exposed to and they come out a little different. That's why they're all well, they're mostly similar, but there are those differences that comes from an environment. So I'll open this portion to questions. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. Somebody will appear with a microphone.
Hello, Jacques. Thank you for giving us this time. Uh, I wanted to ask you, the people who run the military, the people who uh, run the financial organizations, they have this tendency to control and subjugate. Where does this come from? I'm sorry, I could not hear that, Roxanne. What You're asking where, where does it come from, where people want to control? Yes, the tendency to want to control. Why are some people aggressive yes. in trying to control other people? Yes, where because, does this all start? Is that your question, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. Where that comes from, if you have a little, two little boys or three little boys of different age group, usually when one boy doesn't want the other boy to do something, he says, don't do that. And if he doesn't, he hits them. So that little kid controls the smaller kid, wants to control the small kid. If you're brought up in a home where people cooperate rather than fight, they don't want to control. For example, when I was a kid, I built a model airplane, and it went boom, right into the ground. And another kid that was older came up to me and said, your wings are too far back. And I said, what does that do? And he told me. I said, how did you know that? He says, because I did the same thing you did. It went into the ground. And I moved the wings around, and I found out where the wing has to be, so it doesn't do that. Now, that kid could have said, my plane is better than yours, and you're a lousy builder, or he could have shared his ideas. Books are the sharing of ideas, so you don't have to go through the experience to learn something. You can read a book and learn, gee, this forest has wild animals, or a poison snake looks like this, there's pictures in the book. That saves you a lot of experience and maybe your life. So sharing ideas with other people better, but it's not good in the money system. If you have a factory and you can produce stuff faster than me, I produce the same stuff you do, but slow. If you share your ideas with me, you lose the competitive edge. Do you understand that? So you take out patents and you keep your ideas to yourself. So even if you go to church and says, be honest, be kind, be considerate, the system you live under doesn't warrant that. If you have 100 people working for you, and the next day you put up a sign, we're closing shop, they feel bad because you outsource to China. Why? Because the product will cost you less. But if you considered the guys and their families, and you called them in, you said, I'm not going to lay you off. I'm going to still pay you. I'm not going to outsource to China. If your brother-in-law has another factory and he outsourced to China, you can't stay in business. Do you understand that? So you have to be a son of a bitch in the money system. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about the language I use, but there's really no bad language. You know, I've been to uh, over a hundred... I've been to over 100 restrooms. I never found a place to rest. <laughs> so we try not to say things. We say, they're having an affair. They're really fucking. <laughs> they're not having an affair. And we, we teach, try to teach our children to be honest. So, so when the children say, Daddy, where did my little sister come from? The stork brought her. That's a lie. And we say, Santa Claus brings you all the toys on Christmas. That's a lie. Your daddy bought them for you because he'd like you to have these toys. So you start lying to your kids. Why should they believe you? There's no bad language. If you say a person defecated, it means he took a shit. That there's nothing the matter with a guy. When a guy says bullshit, he means I can't accept what you're saying. That's what it means. If a woman drops a pie that she bakes, she might say fiddly dee. He might say, shit, that means I'm sorry I dropped the pie. It has nothing to do with shit. Do you understand that? The people use those words, they're not necessarily bad or good. It's customary that they use those words. In French, if he says shit, if he says mad, oh, what a beautiful language. What does that mean? <laughs> There's a place in Florida called the mouth of the rat. Did you know that? It's called boca raton. That's what it means in Spanish the mouth of the rat. So when you say, I live in Boca Raton, everybody thinks, oh, that's a classy place. It means the mouth of the rat. So what are you going to do with language when a guy says to a girl or another person, they're having an affair? 
He can't say they're having sex relations because that's a no-no. Well, what do you think they're having an affair means? Every soap opera is about who's screwing who, <laughs> isn't it? I don't mean to lie. I mean to be ruthlessly honest with you. And that's the only way you can be. If you want a better and saner world, you have to be ruthlessly honest and share the resources of the earth and to take away all the artificial boundaries that separate people. Next question. Good evening, Jacques. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Hello. Good evening, Jacques. Uh, you just said that uh, genetics is responsible for the way you look and so society makes you, be, uh, makes you do what you do. How do you explain prodigies who, you know, for example, you have people in India who have never been exposed to anything like music, but they are prodigies. How do you explain prodigies if it's not genetics? Is that the question? Okay. A child, like I wanted my child, my mom, my little boy, to become very creative and a genius. Now, how do you do that? I read the lives of all the great men, and it gave me the tools to use. Here's what I did. I used to read to my kid at night, which I told you before, and I closed the book at the most interesting part. He said, but what happened? I said, if you learn to read, you can find out. So I told him about all the wonderful animals, I said, how would you like to go to the zoo to see those animals? He said, when, Daddy, when? And I said, next month. Next month? That's to give him a hunger for it. If you take him right away, you don't generate the right interest. So a month later, I took him to the zoo. And at the zoo, he was looking at every animal, not like ordinary kids, detail. He was looking at all of them in great detail. So I said, I have a business appointment in town. I can only stay 15 minutes. He said, but this is interesting. I, said, I didn't have a business appointment. I cut his interest. And when he came in the car, he was sad. When I got home, I put drawing paper and clay in his room. And there he made little elephants right away. He was drawing rhinoceros. Do you understand? Because I deprived him of that. And he was doing all these wonderful things, and he was happy making these. So I said, outside and play with the other boys. He said, but I like you. I said, outside and play. And he hated my guts. See, I don't understand. But when he got out, the other boys, the kid would say, I can run faster than you, or I can fast fight you. Yeah, nothing interesting. But he wanted to get back very much and make things. And so until the day he died, he was very creative. Now, what is creativity? If you ask a creative person, they don't know. I'm going to tell you what it is, and if you've got a bad memory, make a note of what it is. It's taking standard elements and putting them together in unique ways. That's all it is. So all invention is made up of other inventions. Like I, they tell you in school, somebody invented the wheel, and that was the beginning of the scientific age. That's bullshit also. A tree fell over another tree. When you pulled the top tree, the bottom one rolled. That's where the wheel came from. Nobody says, how's he going to make a wheel? It's ridiculous. The brain doesn't work that way. So they think some people are gifted, some are artistic, some are not. It depends on their background and the accidents that happen to them and their encounters. In other words, if they lose a brother in a war when they're older, they may turn against war. But that's not a good enough reason. But sometimes something happens to a person and, or a car slips off a highway, and he's very saddened by it, and he finds out that salt melts ice. But in America today, we have signs, slippery when wet, drive safely. We put abrasive in the highway, so it's not slippery when wet, and do away with the sign. Or we do things like this in America. We put up signs that says, drive carefully, school children crossing. I'm sure you've all seen that. So what we do is design a pavement that looks like one comb inside the other. When the kid presses the button, the red light goes on, but he can't cross until the pavement turns this way. So no car can hit a kid. Do you understand? When a person says, I'm spiritual, what the hell does that mean? If you make something like this, cars can't hit each other. 
If you put sensors in front of an automobile, if I got mad at you, if I got 40 feet away, the brakes would go on. That's what we need, high tech to prevent accidents. Now, what will people do when machines do everything? You go to art centers, music centers, cultural centers, back to school without debt. No more money. As long as you got money, no matter what you teach people, it's the basis of corruption. You can pay off a senator. You understand? You can bribe an industry. If I own a drug company, I can give a senator a good, huge sum of money, put deposit in a Swiss bank, tell him to uphold my drug company. If I've got a drug company and I found out that celery juice lowers blood pressure, there's no money in that for me. So I tell you to get my drugs, that'll lower your blood pressure. So I'm saying we are basically corrupt if we live in a money system. We all play that game. But if you own a big factory and a new machine comes in, you bought it, a new machine, and you call your helper and you say, you used to work eight hours a day, now you work four hours a day, because this machine turns out more than you could turn out and more than I hope for. Now, instead of a week's vacation every year, you now get three weeks to a month. But people don't do that. They downsize. They say, you no longer work for me. They get rid of you, the profits are higher. So if you're a nice guy and you build a playground for the children of the women that work in your factory, his course are about here. But if you don't build a playground, your profits are higher. This guy won't invest in your company if you don't have a growth curve. You know what I mean? So you're forced to be a son of a bitch. That's what I mean. You, in other words, what do you want? Do you want a world without war, hatred, crime? Then you have to bring the world together and share all the Earth's resources with everyone else. If you fail to do that, your kids may be killed in a nuclear war. That's all I have to say. That's what I meant to get across. I'll try to take on, say, two or three more questions. What are they? Uh, is your question answered? Oh, we that take more questions. Jack, okay. uh, we have time, and his question has not been answered yet. Well, so I'm, I'm going to head back to him. He's asking about what about the idiot And savant you please ask your question again. Savant, idiot savant. Is there anybody who doesn't know what that is? There are yeah, some forms yeah. of idiots that can tell you exactly what happened on February the 8th, 1918. can tell you exactly what happened. How come they can do that? Because there is gadgets in your head called neurotransmitters. Sometimes a kid is born with a whole bunch of them over on one side of the brain. So they can, all dates are clear, but other behaviors not. There's two types of learning in human beings. One is the memory that you encounter. If you see a thorn bush and lean against it, it hurts you. And the other type of learning is when a baby crawls on the floor and learns to get up, but he doesn't know how to walk, so he falls many times. Until he learns to take the weight off this leg and free it and move it in that direction, then you have to take the weight off this leg to move it in that direction. So children learn how to walk, but if you ask them, how do you walk? They can't explain it, because that's physiological learning, not verbal. Uh, same with a bird. When he flaps his wing fast, he goes in a circle. When he flaps it slower, he doesn't. If he flaps them evenly, he moves forward. So a bird moves his wings in different directions until he learns physiologically. But if you ask a bird, if you could, how do you fly, he doesn't know. You ask an artist, how can you draw so well? You never had any lessons. He said, I don't know, it's just natural. So we use words like instinct. How do the fish know how to get to the spawning grounds up the Orinoco River? They swim 3,000 miles. How will the fish do that? A mother fish doesn't open a map and say, come here, you fish, look. You've got to swim 3,000 miles to get there. No, they do it, and they ask the scientists, how does the fish know how to do that? And science says, well, it's instinct. Instinct is a word like bula bula. It doesn't tell you how fish do anything. So don't let anybody get by with words like they do it instinctively. Here's how they do it. The fish have sensors that can feel electromagnetic fields. Sharks and octopus can feel electromagnetic waves. We can't. So people say, do you, do you believe in higher consciousness? I always say to people, what do you mean by that? Well, to be highly aware 
of yourself, your surroundings, and everything else. I said, do you have that? They say, yes. I said, where are your kidneys? Hmm, I'm not sure. How fast is the blood moving through your blood vessel? The vein and the artery. I don't know. Well, how would you stop cars or elevators from falling down the shaft? They don't have higher consciousness. Nobody does. You can only be as conscious as your receptors. I don't know if you know what that means. If you don't know what it means, uh, there are radio waves going through here. None of us are, can feel that. There are thousands of bacteria all over everything. We can't see that. The microscope extends human attributes so we can now see things we used to think were not there. So now if you think about it a little bit more, you'll find that when, when human beings can't see something, they judge the world by what they can see. The, the telescope, the electron microscope, can see atoms. We can't see atoms. And a man came up to me and said, well, don't you believe in consciousness? I said, yes, we all have limited consciousness. But when you use the word, I'm interested in higher consciousness, I have to know what the hell that means. What does it mean? And if they can't describe it, they're just using words. There are many words that have no meaning at all. Have a nice day. What the hell? Do you control the weather? <laughs> no, we talk automatically at people. You know, we don't even think about what we say. And that's why we're in trouble. Psychiatrists and psychologists are really sick. They adjust you to this system. You have to be stupid to do that. And psychologists have a very high rate of suicide. Did you know that? So they're not that bright. Neither are your schools. They still don't know what makes war, what makes a serial killer. They still don't know those things. And so they invent their own stories that God made the world in six days. You know what that means? It was turning while he was making it. Because you can't get daylight unless the earth spins. So it means God was making it while it was turning. <laughs> but if you don't follow the teachings of Christ or religion or the Ten Commandments or any of the religious teachings, you burn eternally. Doesn't it sound like an idea of a psychopath? <laughs> That's not the idea of a God who's all merciful, all loving. And in, in many churches today, they want to put the Ten Commandments in church. Whereas the, the Sermon on the Mount says, you shall love one another and do unto others you have us do unto you. Why don't they put that in there? No businessman pays his help uh, a sufficient salary to live well and drive the car he wants to drive. They pay you whatever they can get away with. And minimum wage, when you get minimum wage, you can't buy the car you want, you can buy what you can afford. So if you buy an old beat up Volkswagen that needs a brake job, but your kid needs to be taken to a doctor because he's sick, so you have to say, well, I'll get the brake job next payday. And if your car brakes fail, this guy drives a Mercedes, you can kill him. Do you understand? In the future, there are no old cars on the road. They wear as much as a new car. We take them in every year and reprocess them. Everything that you have in your home is the best we know how to build. There's no more cheap stuff out there. Now, let me tell you one more interesting thing. When you come in for a landing in an airplane today, if your brakes or your landing gear doesn't come down, you're in trouble. If you press the button to bring your landing gear down and it doesn't come down, that blows the fuel out. Because most people are not killed in air crashes. They're killed by the fuel spilling over a hot engine and it explodes. So if you design airplanes where the passenger section, when you land, disengages and goes down into the air terminal and the full one comes up. But here you have to wait for everybody to get out of the airplane and everybody gets back in. That's whole, an airplane doesn't need to rest. So you get three times the amount of airplanes. Today they have container ships. They unload one container at a time. That ship cost a billion dollars. It's tied up for three days. We would float the whole container section off the ship and float a new one on. That gives you more shipping, more goods and services available. When a person says to me, how can you feed everybody and take care of everybody by using your resources intelligently? That's what that means. Any other questions? Yes. Question has not been answered yet. He doesn't understand Thank you. your answer. He's 
Still on in the genetics What's the question? Jack. Which one? The second. Yeah. His question is, how do you explain a three-year-old composing music? Or when, when, when you see these, you know, geniuses which come out of nowhere, how does that happen? There was a story in the book called Anomalies and Curiosities in Medicine, if you want to find out in detail. This kid was blind and he was black. And when he was nine years old, the whole world to him was dark. But he used to sit in the master's house and listen to music. They would play a piano all the time for years. Then one day on Christmas, they let him into the house. And his whole world, hearing, was picked up because he used to lean against the window as a kid. And he was able to pick the notes off faster than the average kid. He was called Blind Tom. Now, all prodigies, all of them, if you check them out, you'll find their background to be unique or different. It was my grandfather that said to me, Jock, all people came from all over the world to America, and they brought the printing press, the algebra, mathematics came from the Arab world, and he showed me where all these things came from. And he said, Jock, if you pledge allegiance to the United States, you're negating everybody else. So pledge allegiance to the earth and everyone on it. And that loused me up for life. Can you understand that? My grandfather was different than the average person. And he gave me a few tools I would never have had as a kid. So I said, well, where'd you get all these ideas for the new city? I got all the ideas from the human body. Here's how. If the brain said, I do all the thinking, I want most of the nutrients. The lungs would say, if I don't put oxygen in the blood, you would die as a brain. So the brain says, what do you need? Everything you need. Every vitamin, everything. So then the kidney would say, if I don't filter the blood, both of you guys are dying. So all the organs of the body get whatever the hell they need. And that's the same for humanity. If a man steals a $100 watch, it's a third crime, you put him in jail for two, three years. I said, cheaper to give him 10 watches. You know what it cost to keep them there for three years? It's cheaper to give them a watch. It's cheaper to give things to people and put them in jail. No matter what you see, if you see $300 worth of goods, you put you in jail for four years, that costs the government $10,000. You understand? So in the future, they are the worst mathematicians I've ever heard of. Anyway, what you do, you just make things available to people. If you live near a waterfall where there's good drinking water, natural, lots of it, no one comes at night, fills the canteen, and sneaks off. It's only when there's scarcity of something that a person behaves badly. Scarcity. So through technology, we can overcome scarcity, and people will behave very differently. But when you start this separation of people, saying some are born gifted, others are not born this way, you're giving false information. I've had classes with 10 or 20 children, and they all get 100. There's no variations. Depends on your ability to communicate. So you must communicate on different levels with different people. I'm sorry I don't have the time for long seminars and give you all the details. I'd like to fill you in as best I can. We have time for more questions. Well, go on. That's good. I'm glad. Yeah. Okay, uh, my question is um, regarding your uh, concept of how people take part within a resource-based economy. In the activist orientation video, it says that a person will input his decision and the database will cross-relate the information and then if it's accepted, it's passed on to the interdisciplinary teams. Now, one problem which I found with this approach is that um, the database will fix within a limited paradigm of information. And anything which is contradictory, a new breakthrough in methodology, for example, will be rejected outright. So how will this problem be addressed? So I'll repeat that question. What he's saying is, in future, gov government or the cybernated government that we'll have, it will have people feeding in information if there is something new somebody comes up with. Okay. He feeds in, Jack, uh, so that's not the question. The question is, if somebody new feeds in that uh, in that information, that system is already made with a set paradigm or set set of informations. 
So how will it accept new information? Will it have the capability of accepting new information? Okay. I think if, if this is what you want to know. Uh, who programs the computers? How does computer get information? Does somebody... How, how would the computer um, do a new paradigm? How does it update okay. Okay. how it does things with new information? It. Can the computer go on making its own decisions without anybody programming? That's more like what you want to know. How can the, can the computer arrive at decisions without being programmed? Is that what you want to know? Jack, his question is, how does a computer accept new information? Because in a cybernated government, the co computer takes in information from everywhere and makes decisions. Okay. But okay. now, if something new has come, Will it have the capability to understand that this is something new? Because it already has a set paradigm or set parameters. Let me try that. Sure. Okay. The computer of the future will be connected to industry, transportation, distribution centers. You understand that? They'll be connected. So when you submit an idea to the computer, it has access to everything in existence. Suppose you submit a new invention to a computer. It compares it with the known knowledge connected to every library of information. And it'll come back and tell you that was invented, what you think is new, was invented in 1927. Because the computer has access to existing information. Say you work on a lab, you're working on cancer. The minute you find the answer to cancer, a light blinks in all the other labs and says, now work on cystic fibrosis. We got the answer. That's filed in the computer system. So the computer has the ability to scan. When you walk into a doctor's office, he looks at you and he examines your eyes and your skin. Whatever he does, he's learned to do. He isn't born that way. Somebody says, these black spots are poor circulation and these wrinkles are due to aging. The doctor has to be told that. Then they show him pictures and he says, that's cancer, that's cystic fibrosis, that's measles. He memorizes those patterns. You can do the same thing with a computer. Photograph every known skin disease and hold it up in front of a scanner and it'll tell you the latest treatment. It'll take you an hour and a half to make a dermatologist. Other than that, you have to wipe the baby's ass, send it to school for years before you get that information. It's very easy. I would say 15 years from now, most dermatologists be out of work. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Did I answer your question? Okay. You have to put sensory devices on machines. If you have an airplane and there's a pea soup fog, the pilot can't see the runway. Do you understand that? So there's infrared cameras that photograph the runway. And that enables a plane with Doppler radar to make a landing without the pilot. Did you know that? You have to give the machine what you call machine intelligence or human intelligence. Suppose you made a model airplane. I'm sure you've seen it. The guy has control and he does a loop in a barrel roll with a model. Today, you can put a chip in that plane. Forget about it. The plane will take off. It'll do a loop, a barrel roll, and land. But if there was an earthquake and it cracked the runway, the plane will land and tumble over. Unless you put a sensor in front of that plane that scans before it lands and says, it's cracked, I'm going to land elsewhere. It doesn't say that. It doesn't. So you see... It has to do with the intelligence of the designer. Machines are as dumb or as smart as, as a designer. Then the person said to me, can the machine be better than the designer? I know a little guy that designed a machine to pick up a freight train and empty it. He can't do that. The guy that designs machines in factories where thousands of bottles go by and milk and they're filled with these spots automatically. He can't do that that fast. No man can do that. Nine months ago, a computer could handle 1,000 trillion bits of information per second. I don't care who you get today. No humans can do that. No humans can tell you exactly how high they are off the ground in an airplane. Doppler radar can. Tells you 5,340 feet, 10 inches off the ground. No human can do that. Is that a machine takeover? No. Machines will be assigned tasks that we can't handle. I don't know if I'm getting to you. 
machine will be used to measure the height in the future rather than the guy looking out saying, I'm 10 feet high. Yes. Um, hi, my question is, uh, what would you recommend to a person who wanted to reach your level of uh, intelligence, understanding, and clarity in the most efficient and effective way and is um, also a futurist and uh, wants to be a competent multidisciplinarian? What would you tell somebody who wants to um, accumulate information quickly as a multi who's interested in the future and wants to be a multidisciplinarian? Oh, well, I would suggest that you study any branch of science and in your spare time read any book you can get hold of on scientific phenomena, geology, structural engineering, mathematics. The more you know about that, the more you can bring to a subject. The less you know about it, you keep scratching your head. And, and what you have to do is provide people with that information. Is there a hierarchy, I mean, um, of learning a certain science and focusing more on that that you can say from your experience that uh, learning that helped you learn all the other sciences much more easily? Is there a hierarchy that you can study to learn other sciences much more easily? Uh, unfortunately, there isn't any single thing. I'll tell you what you can do, though. Years ago, when I was about 12 years old, I was very curious about airplanes. How can they fly on this thin stuff? And I asked my relatives, and they didn't know. So I went to the library to get a book out by the Wright brothers, and that I felt would tell me. But it didn't. When I opened the book, it said, it was a sunny day in May, and Mrs. Orville Wright was hanging clothing on the line. That bothered me, because I didn't want to know about the weather or Mrs. Orville Wright. I just want to know how planes fly. I had to read that whole book filled with sunny day in May. <laughs> it was near the end of the book, they killed the pigeon and put wires in its wings and moved them up. That was information. So you have to learn when you read any book to scratch out the bullshit and pick up the real substance. A lot of books are sunny day in May. Reason? They get paid by the word. Did you know that? Okay. So. So if you understand what I'm talking about, you'll begin to read and say, wait, this is no information yet. Then you'll learn to underline real information instead of sunny day in May. This note, the monetary system, is a debt monetary system. And the note is an interest-bearing debt note. It does not qualify, does not deserve to earn the word money on it. Hey, Roxanne, did you get that? So, the, the question is, question is, why call it money when the reality it is not money? The note in circulation, which is circulating as money, is the biggest misnomer, the biggest blunder, because in the reality it is an interest-bearing debt note destructive in the nature. Why call it money? Why are we calling currency notes money? We didn't make the system. No, no. <laughs> I am saying, I found out 20 years ago in Los Angeles, that this note is interest-bearing debt note. It does not qualify as money. So I immediately stopped calling it money, and I even stopped doing business with the note as the money. I even stopped filing income tax return because the note does not qualify for income or profit or loss. So why are you calling it money? Because you have done so much, already so much work on it regarding the monetary system. I don't understand your So question. I don't know if there's a question there. No, I, I don't know whether there's a question. He's, he's They're kind of sir, on the same problem. page, right? Why are you calling it money because it's not really money, it's really debt, the reality Okay, so this, yes. he's calling it that money because it apart from you, everybody else can understand what he's talking about. Uh, money, right. Okay. So we will go to the next question. Yeah, we'll go to the next question. Uh, you want to take somebody from that side? 
Jacques, yeah. how close is your concept city? How close it is now to reality? How close is the city to reality? Oh, did you use the word perfect? No, no. How oh. close how, to developing it, you mean? Yes. Yes. There's, there's no utopia. No, he's saying how long will it be until the city's done? I, I can take I it. can't answer that. She can, maybe. He's asking how close we are to building the city, is that right? Well, Jacques done all the work in terms of what the city would be like, the blueprints, how it would be built, how it can be built efficiently and clean and all of that. But Jacques and I have no money. We have no power. We can't tell you when it will be built. It's not up to us. It's up to what everyone else does to make this happen who you can talk to, who you can introduce this project to. You know, it, Jacques and I worked for 35 years in obscurity, and it took one person, Peter Joseph, to make a film, because he understood this direction. And in a little over a year, we have branches, we have chapters all over the world, and hundreds of thousands of people working in this direction. But, so it just really depends on who we meet, who you talk to and how much you do to make this a reality. Uh, my question is that uh, we are having the same problems for thousands of years. Poverty, war, crime. So my question is, what are the environmental parameters which has triggered this, I mean, this movement? Why now? Why, are not, why we are now hearing, to, hearing about the research-based economy now? Why don't we do it now? Why is it now that we are hearing a solution? Oh, because there's unemployment. Uh, he's saying, why is it only now that we're hearing about a solution? Why, why it's been around for thousands of years? Oh, it's been around a long time. But people have to lose their jobs, their homes, their bank accounts. The banks have to fail. General Motors failed. Chevy failed. And we gave them public funds to build them out. That's the money of the people, their retirement fund. We gave that to the banks and the people that created the problem. That tells you who really owns the country. Well, you, was your question, why are we only hearing about a resource-based economy now after this has been around for so many years? My question was that, what are the environmental parameters which has triggered this movement now? Because we had those problems for thousands of years. That's right. That's right. A lot of people um, talk about the problems that we have, but they don't offer solutions. I think uh, Jacques came up, he had a very different background. He came up through the Great Depression, and he also had a technical background. So he worked on solving problems that, um, he worked on solving the problems that we have today, finding out what what causes the aberrant behavior, what causes war, what causes poverty, where other people try and do patchwork within the system and don't, don't work outside of the box. Unfortunately, this is the stage of evolution. I see no other person who has worked on this or who arrived at these directions, and um, now we have a lot of the solutions and it's up to us, you know, like I said before. So unfortunately, this is just where we are in the evolutionary stage of things. We have to go through so many things. We'd even have to go through, even somebody standing up and talking about this direction is not gonna make it happen. People will, because they, they, are not, they are not educated emotionally or intellectually as to what society <coughs> can be, they'll have to fall on their face. They'll have to lose their jobs, lose confidence in their elected leaders, lose their homes before they look around and say, or even look for another alternative. And that's why it's so important to have this direction out there so we might go towards the right direction at that time or do as much as we can now to get there. Uh, you say that uh, 
Yeah, you say that uh, we have to move towards a resource-based system, but right now we are in a very monetary-based system. How do you propose to bring about that change? And also, if we are self-sufficient, then you have a lot of people who would be idle, uh, playing video games or something. There won't be growth. Yeah. Yeah. Second, if we get there, yeah. We'll answer the first question. Okay. See if we can answer the second question. But the answer is this. How do we get from the monetary system to a resource-based economy? How do we get from here to there? Really? Okay. Uh, the question is how we get from here to the future. We want to make a motion picture, a major film. And that movie is about the next 50 years, showing what the world could be. And in that movie, you have a family of the future, and they're walking in the, in the beautiful countryside, and a little girl, which is seven years old, but the, the children of the future will be more like adults. They won't be like us at all. Today, you have Mickey Mouse clubs for kids. You don't have that kind of crap in the future. You have reality. Children can learn geology, bridge building, mathematics. They don't have to give them fairy tales. Some dummy reads that, and they have Mickey Mouse clubs for kids to join. That retards your children. So I'm saying that the future will generate people that are very different than we are. They will not be what you see. Normal people use words like jealousy as being natural. They say that jealousy is an inborn, natural human trait. So I met a psychologist, and I said to him, that jealousy is learned. He said, I disagree with you. He said, whenever I pick up my cat to put on my lap, the dog growls. Arr. So it must be natural. So I said, if it's natural, watch what happens. I took a cat and picked it up and put it on my lap, and the dog growled. Then I fed the, fed the dog fresh liver and reached for the cat, and I did that 20 times. When the dog saw me reach for the cat, the tail would wag. Because if it was inborn, that dog would still growl. Do you understand? I want to see if it was real. Was it a natural thing, or was it due to the events all around? The same with children. If you pit one child against the other, you produce aberrant behavior. Never do that. Never tell your wife how dumb she is, or what she doesn't know. You don't generate anything. Show her a better way of doing things instead of criticize. And that's the way where antagonism, they think that antagonism is natural. I taught raccoons, if you've seen our films. They come up and they sit on a chair around a table before I feed them. I said, how do you do that? Well, I showed them how. When I joined the Ku Klux Klan, people said, well, how did you change them? You can't change them unless you talk to their leader first. The leader said to me, Jock, you're a smart guy. This is what he said. What do you think of the Ku Klux Klan? I said, it was a great organization, but it didn't go far enough. That goes, what do you mean? But if you just say, it's a detrimental organization, it's horrible, you don't get anywhere. Always say, whatever person, it's a great idea, but it doesn't go far enough. He said, what do you mean? That gives you a chance to tell them. Do you understand? So I did an experiment years ago called the Immaculate Pig. Did anybody ever hear of it or see it? I, I filmed the pig brought up in a cage that looked like a dome, a real pig. I had a wastebasket in the middle and some paper nearby. And I knew that the pig accidentally will knock that paper into the wastebasket in time. I didn't know when it would happen. But that pig was in the cage, and he knocked that paper in. And the pig didn't understand, but inside the basket, there was a switch called a micro switch. When the paper hit it, dispenser dispensed a little bit of food for that pig. But it took the pig 10 times before he understood that the paper in the wastebasket causes food to drop out. So I then, once the pig learned that, I raised the basket up. I started with the basket down and flush because it takes me too long to teach a pig to pick up paper and put it in the basket. But if you've got a hole, he puts it in it. Then you lift it up. And it said on the basket, put waste here. 
So when I let the pig into that room, I put a second piece of paper. He put the first one in the basket, he waited under the dispenser, and nothing happened. So he saw the other piece of paper. This is called associative memory. He picked up the other piece and put it in, then the dispenser dispensed food. Then I put three dirty rags around, and the pig came in and picked up the dirty rags. Then I put a white jacket on a pig with a red cross, and it said, the immaculate pig. So when the pig came into the room with all the dirt, picked it all up. The next thing I wanted the pig to do was to change his dirty bed sheet. So I put the pig in a smaller cage with a bed over two rollers. The bed sheet went around two rollers. And I put a wheel on one. So if you put a pig or an animal, any animal, in a cage, they walk up and back. Or you put a man in prison, they walk up and back. So the pig got up on a wheel and started to turn it, and that changed the dirty bed sheet. Do you understand that? If you put a, a, a wheel in a cage of rats, they get in and they run. You don't have to teach them to do that. So when the pig got up on this, because he has adrenaline, and he's turning this wheel, and that changed the dirty bed sheet. Went from the top to the bottom. The next thing I want to do is teach the pig how to take a shower. So I built a rubber tube around like that, like the letter U, with bamboo on top. When the pig came out of the little building, it scratched his back. Well, pigs like their back scratched, so he went up and back to get his back scratched. Once that was established, I screwed a jar full of water and soap, and when the bamboo touched the pig, the shower went on. Then I ran that film at a Ku Klux Klan meeting. And they were looking at it, and they said, Jock, I raised me a lot of pigs. I ain't never seen no pig that smart. <laughs> How come? I said, because I raised that pig in a different environment. And they said, I don't understand you. So I explained more detail, and then they understood it. Then I taught them how to train their dogs and animals. Then I told them my biggest problem was training a snake. How do you get to a snake? I can't talk to it. I can't set up anything. So I worked on a lot of things, and nothing worked with a snake. So I put a, gla I put a brown mild mouse in the cage, and the snake would center its head and grab the mouse and swallow it. Then I put a white mouse there and put a sheet of glass between the white mouse and the snake. And the snake would center its head and hit the glass. After 10 times, I took the glass out. That white mouse can go anywhere, and the snake wouldn't attempt to get him. You understand? <laughs> But if you find one mechanism of control, you can take it from there. So I found out how to teach anybody how to draw as long as they had hands or could hold a pencil. And I found that there's no such thing as special abilities in anyone if you know how to get to them. It's cheaper for school to give you a grade rather than learn how to get you to understand something. You know, that's why the teachers give you an A, a B, and a C. That's your problem doesn't make it their problem. But if you want to teach people things, you have to learn how do they learn. If you show a cannibal a watch, he doesn't say, my, my, how detailed, so much intricate stuff. His brain doesn't have that. If you still don't understand me, an Eskimo never dreams of walking on a palm fringe beach. And if you ask an Eskimo, you can have anything, what do you want? Now, I'm talking about an Eskimo that never traveled anywhere or saw books. He doesn't say, I want a stainless steel refrigerator. He can't, because he's never seen anything like that. So he says, I'd like more seals in the area, you know, that I can hunt. You ask an Indian, what's heaven like? He says, it's a happy hunting ground. Lots of deer, lots of bow and arrows. What do you expect of an Indian? Do you see what I mean? Man cannot think outside of his background. Another question, John? Yes. Hi, Jacques. Um, <coughs> yeah. uh, my question is, how do you explain psychopaths? I mean, is there any genetic propensity of being aggressive, of being a killer? Or oh, is it the environment altogether? to be a killer, how do you explain psychopaths? Okay. A psychopath is a person brought up in an environment that's very inconsistent. 
where the father tells the son how much he loves him and then he slaps him sometimes and becomes inconsistent and the brain associative system becomes inconsistent. But if you bring up a kid, if you know what I mean by logically, bring them up to understand, give them kids where things go together, you know what I mean? So he understands the association. For example, you have a motor in a car and it drives a differential which drives the rear wheels. In the future, the motor will be in the middle of the wheel, drive it directly. Do you understand that? Sure. Designers don't understand that, apparently. They have to wait till they get there. I'm just going to tell you a few things about the future after the next question. Do you want to do Albert Fish? It's a better example. I did it. I did it. I did Albert Fish. I don't know where you were. I talked to you about the guy that ate 45 children, did I? No, Albert, Albert Fish. Fish. Albert Fish. And the, psych the psychiatrist says, I don't want to kill him. I want to try to find out what made him that way. And he found out when he was a kid, he was touching his private parts. And the mother said, you're going to burn in hell? Don't you remember talking about that? No, you didn't give that example. Well, I did it to the kids that were up front then. Yeah. And what happened is, he found out what made the kid that way. And that... The job is then to get rid of the conditions that make a person a serial killer or make a person a, 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 a bully. You know what a bully is? Most policemen are bullies because they, they take those jobs. They, you know, when you drive your car and you're drunk or something, policemen pull over, get out of that car. Well, let me see your license. They're not pleasant. They work for you, but they are bullies. And a bully is a guy who comes from an environment where you respect bullies. You know, like the Ku Klux Klan had a lot of bullies in it. And when you joined the Klan, they treated you with respect no matter who you were. And that's why people joined. They had a low self-sufficiency in the Klan. They were honored and treated well. That I noticed very distinctly. And I noticed what it is that makes people bullies, creative artists, or what. I told you my kid, when I broke the zoo appointment with him and he took him home, I put clay and drawing paper there. I knew he would make animals and draw them. I knew that those are the conditions that make an artist. But if you don't know that, you, uh, you don't know how to teach your kid how to draw. Also, we think of psychopaths or killers in a certain way, but yet we honor and put medals on, on kids that go and bomb people faster and more efficiently and, and aim right on the city and, and kill everybody that's in there. These are really psychopaths too, but we don't realize what a psychopath is in that area. That's right. A soldier is a killing machine. Bush was a tremendous psychopath. <laughs> Along with Dick Cheney and the rest of the bums. Okay. So uh, there's one been, more question, uh, yeah, have, Aditya. He asks, if we do whatever you are asking us to do, Jack, the world will be become world will become a mechanical place. There will be no human aspect. He said, if we do what you want to do with technology, the, the world would be a mechanical place, no human aspect. Yeah. Uh, the reason for all the technology that I talk about is to free human beings from going to dirty jobs every day doing the same thing. That isn't good for people either. We want to make a world that makes everything accessible pe to people so they have all the education they need, they can t enjoy life, they can go around the world and visit different places. So I don't know what could be more humane-like than that. I, I don't know a society today that's geared toward people. Today, they don't care at all about people. We're trying to des design a society that's for the benefit of people and the environment. So they probably don't know much about the Venus Project or didn't understand it, if, if you feel that. It's all to promote humanity. If all of you have seen the cities of the sea, I didn't get a chance to tell you what they're for. They're to rebuild the reefs, clean out the oceans, mold the filth. The U.S. Army dumped 65 tons of nerve gas 
into the ocean off the coast of Miami. I'm sure you didn't know that. And those of you that do are very few. So how can you love your country and do that in the oceans? All I'm doing with the machines is to give you more time to be with your family and your kids or go back to school. Today, American kids, I can't talk about this area, hang out in malls. A lot of kids, you'll see a lot of them walking through a mall. We should have art centers, music centers, cultural centers, where these kids can go to become better than just hanging out in Coke stands or burger stands. We don't even know what it means to be human today because we made a cog on the wheel to work for people. You know, it's, a, a grocer stands in a store all day hoping people will come in and buy things. I don't want anybody standing in a store. We can dispense food automatically. You just press a button, you get the hair tonic or whatever the hell you want. You don't need to waste a human being's time waiting, hoping customers come in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your automobile in the future will tell you they're going in for repair. And it'll go to the repair station. And it'll plug in. And that'll tell the mechanism what to do. Now, I ain't trying to explain that to you. Today, if you have something wrong with your car, you bring it to a garage. The guy says, come back in three days. So you rent a car. In the future, there are two handles. You turn down and you pull the motor out like a dresser drawer, shove in a courtesy motor and lock it, and you take off. You don't need to keep your car there for three days. The way things are working today, if the automobile companies had to service their own cars, I can assure you there'd be a cannon plug with multiple outlets. When you pull the engine out, it disengages all the electrical connections in one shot. Today, they got the wires all over the place. That you have to pay for that to get your car fixed. You understand? When you design a tire that won't wear out, if you design a tire that last five years, the tire company will buy that, but they won't produce it. Can you understand that? Why produce a tire that'll put you out of business? Okay, other questions? I just want to mention, too, that today people are afraid of machines. They think they're inhuman because they are, because they're used to abuse and hurt people. They're used as rockets, or when a new machine comes in, people are put out of work, but people don't get a higher standard of living when that happens. But in a resource-based economy, when a machine comes in and puts you out of work, that means they can produce things faster, so you get more leisure time, plus you get more access to goods and services. And become more human. There is one question. What happens if two men like one woman? Are we going to have the concept of marriage in the future, or what is going to happen if... Are we going to have marriage no, in the question. future? What if two people like one woman? Well, I can't understand how some guy with a white collar says, I pronounce you man and wife. Who the hell is he? <laughs> then, if you don't get along, which is possible, there's another guy called a lawyer. It'll cost you 3,000 bucks if you want to separate. Then your wife says, I want the car, the house, and the kids. What happened to love? Where is it? Is there such a thing as love? We say no, because none of us here like everything we've ever done in life, when you think about it. There are things you've done that you didn't like, so if you live with a replica of yourself, how long would you be together? Think about that. So love, sometimes you love the person, sometimes you like yourself, sometimes a little more, sometimes not at all, sometimes how did I do such a stupid thing? So even against yourself, your love moves up and down. So if you marry another person, sometimes you'll love them a lot, sometimes more. Sometimes, how the hell do I get into this? So love is a fluctuating thing, not a fixed thing. If you don't understand that, you have to think about it a lot. I'm trying to take away the illusions, that's all. I'm trying to get you to face reality to be honest with yourself and the world you live in. If you want a better world, you have to get up off your ass and make it better, not hope it gets better. 
That's what Jesus tried to do. That's what Gandhi tried to do. That's what Martin Luther King did. Nobody said to Martin Luther King, if you march into the South, we'll put $3,000 in the bank or 10000 No, he did it because he believed in it. Gandhi did it because he believed in it. Nobody gave him any money to, to try to break connections with the controlling countries. You see, the real people didn't do it for money. They did it because they believed in it. And that's the kind of doctors we want in the future, and that's the kind of people we want in the future. We don't trust people that do it for money. You help an old lady across the street because you feel for her. But if you wonder, what does she do after you get her across the street? That's what the Venus Project is about. You take care of all people without any kind of forms to fill out without getting along with Fresco. If I design a city and I say that's utopia, I'm killing the future. Any city I design will be a straitjacket to the kids of the future. They'll design their own cities. So there's no heroes in the future, no great people. They're just people and they all work to better the lives of everyone else. Are there any other questions? So when you say in the future people will have time for recreational activities like golf, which is a competing game, wouldn't that create more conflict and uh, competition and you understand what I mean? I'm saying when you say people will play golf, isn't that more competition and, and uh, isn't that a game of competition? You're right, but in the future you play golf against yourself. You play tennis against another virtual image of yourself and you improve your game. You don't want to beat other people, you want to improve your ability. So there's no need to beat anybody at anything. In fact, if you're better at something, you try to teach other people how to be better. The more people you teach, the richer the world. The more you keep it to yourself, the problems are going to grow. So we must share ideas and not take out patents and bring the world together so you don't need armies built all over the place. Otherwise, you're all going to build armies because you don't trust each other. That's what it's about. Any other questions? Any other questions? How much money do you need for the first model city or the demo city or the research center which you want or the theme park or whatever? You, something that you can actually show people that in real. So how much money do you need for the first one? How much and, money do we need for the first city? And before you answer that, I have already told him that it depends on how much money we are able to collect. That's right. So that is not a satisfactory answer. Because since you have made blueprints and all this, do you have at least a ballpark figure? No, a lot of people come to us and say, well, how much would it be to do a city of like $30,000? I, I mean, 30,000 people, I want to know how to do that. Even the, um, the estimates, there's a lot of blueprints that have to be done. We have to go out and get estimates for certain things. And we didn't get, we didn't do that. It's very time consuming and very costly because we don't know at the time when people really want to go with this. I mean, I would say if you want to know how much it'll cost, but do you, how much, do you have money that you want to put into it and how much money do you have? We would build a city with that, depending on if we could. If not, we'd use it to do the preliminary studies for a city of a certain size. If we took our time and funds to do a city of a certain size, we don't know what happens later when somebody comes, okay, I have the finances to do a city for two million, I want that. You know, so it's, it's, it's not the area that, that we put our time and money in. Uh, in the building of a new city, we're going on a tour around the world. And we went to Turkey, and Turkey said, after I spoke there, they said, what do we have to do to make a resource project in Turkey? Now, right after that, economic drop, and they couldn't follow through. So we're going on a world tour now. And on the world tour, there are people now that are promising us hundreds of acres in Latin America. That isn't the answer either. 
We need the hundreds of acres of promise of concrete and contractors. We need many things. But before that, we need the majority of the world's people to identify with the Venus Project. But if you just build one city, one place, it won't work. And also... You have a mic. You have a mic. Oh. Go ahead, just talk. Yes. When in building one city, one place, it doesn't do the job. And if you took normal people, normal means loused up. If you took normal people and put them in the city, they'd louse it up. So you can't move into the new city unless you go to an orientation center. Don't let that scare you. That means that when you want to fly an airplane, they don't put you in an airplane. They put you in a dummy plane and you move the controls. Once you get that, then they tell you how to check your tires, then they put you in an airplane, fly you around, then let you handle it. You have to put a person in an aviation environment. If you want to make a chemist, you put them in a chemistry university, a doctor in a medical environment. So we have to orient people as to how the new city works, that you don't go to work in the morning, that there are no humans operating elevators. In other words, when I was a kid, women used to operate elevators. They turned a crank to try to get to the floor. Never quite easy. Today you press 20 and it takes you right there. I don't know if you noticed this. Every modern airport has trains. There are no people who operate those trains. There's no conductors. They stop exactly at the platform and they travel automatically. We want to automate we don't want people sitting in a train steering it or guiding it. We want electronic systems in the rails. If they disengage or break, the train stops. I don't want a train to be derailed. Do you understand? You can use science and technology for making a comfortable world, but then I don't want people to be just comfortable. I want them to learn to develop new ways of thinking so we can wipe out heart disease, cancer, suffering all over the world. That is the message. I'm not interested in machines. Only to free people from boring, dirty, dangerous jobs. We have no fire engines in the future. But everything in the building is completely fireproof, so you don't need fire engines. People have questions, Jacqueline. Yes. Gary, do you have any other questions? How do we resolve conflict in future? How do you resolve conflicts in the future? That's done in school when the children are very young. A conflict is an area of disagreement. And if people disagree, when scientists say, my, my, the metal I've got in my hand now is stronger than the metal you've got, so they put it in the machine and it tests it, and the other guy is disproven right away. You don't have conflict because you have a way of putting it to test. Do you understand? But if you don't have that, you have conflict. There must be a way of test. That's what scientists do all the time. They take a cable and see how much weight it can hold up. You know, when I worked in the aircraft industry, they'd finish an airplane. Then they'd take it up and dive it down and pull out to see if the wings still hold up. So if you figure the wings can hold 25 pounds per square foot, they pile sandbags on the wing till it breaks off. And if it breaks off at 27 pounds, they say, good, my calculations are all right. Another thing they do is when they finish the airplane, they pull it up 30 feet off the ground and cut the cable to see if the landing gear holds up. I love that system. It has no opinions in it. And what do you think? What do you think? What do you know? Not what do you think? So that system of putting things to test. If we build a city and it doesn't work, we change it. Do you know what I mean? There's nobody comes and says, oh, let's do this, let's do that. Somebody said to me in conflict, what if a young lady designs an airplane with a wing swept forward and another young lady designs an airplane with a wing swept backward? Who decides which one is built? We build both. Why do you have to do this or that? What a stupid question that is. Don't you see, the system of science is to test things, see how they work. And if it doesn't work, change it. Now today, when a person has cancer, they tell you you can live five years if you undergo chemo or radiation therapy. 
radiation burns the cancer, it burns the cells, and the chemotherapy is not very good either. So what they should have done in medicine, what they will do in the future, is take a cancer cell and keep it alive by artificial circulation and treat that. And once you've got control of living substance, that's what the problem's about, not giving people injections or trying different things or telling them we got 10 months to live. That's no answer. The real answer is, what is life? What is living substance? Then we have to learn how to control life, make cells multiply faster, slow them up, gain control of bacteria and cells. Once you gain that, you can treat any disorder. They don't even know what the hell to do in medicine. They were looking for the cause of cancer. My cancer was caused by this or that. Cancer is caused by many interacting variables. If you don't understand that, my kid said to me, Daddy, what makes an airplane fly? Is it the propeller? I said, if you don't have a motor turning that propeller, it won't move. Is it the motor? No. If you don't put gasoline in it, the motor won't turn. Is it the gasoline? If there's no oxygen, the gasoline won't combust. He said, what is it that makes an airplane? Many interacting variables. So I'm kind of saying, what makes a serial killer? You know, that or this? It isn't that simple. It's many different things that occur to that child. Are there any other questions? You've yeah, got one here. Yeah. Uh, Ali, you mentioned you're making a movie uh, regarding a girl and all. So, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, what's the name of the movie? When can we expect it? We'd like to do a major motion picture to show to the general public what the future would be like. So we'd, we'd, um, we'd start it in the future, and then we'd have flashbacks of how we get from here to there. We're working on the script that's practically done. We're looking for people who can produce it, and we, we already have a whole group of people who are working on animations to help move this along. So that's pretty much where we're at. We're we talking to different people. Yeah. The motion picture, we did that in Venus. We're talking to different people now about that. We'll see what happens. How about some more negatives? OK, we have one more question here. Or, yeah, one second. Hi. Uh, creativity is, uh, uh, creativity is, is, is something which comes out of nothing. In, in a holistic sense, uh, and not in a partial sense. Something that comes out of nothing in a holistic sense. What's that? Creativity is something that comes out of nothing in a holistic sense. Do you have a question about that? Yeah, and science has basically failed to recognize this. Uh, what is the response to that? If science what? Science has basically failed to recognize this fact. I, so I, I, I want his response to that. Uh, what his question is, is that science appears to have failed to recognize this, and he wants to know if science Jack has, has a failed to recognize creativity as coming out of nothing. And he'd like to know your response. Well, I don't understand your language, sir. It has no meaning to me. That's why I would suggest that you read a book called Language and Thought and Action by Hayakawa. Another one called The Tyranny of Words. Some words have no meaning, like, I wish the world would live in peace. How do you do that? That's real. But I wish the world would live in peace is bullshit, okay? You have to learn a new language, the language that has physical reference. Whenever you talk, if a person says, I'm a nature lover, I meet people like that, I say, really? You love nature? That means you love earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, and sharks, and rattlesnakes? What do you mean by I love nature? It's such a stupid thing, a statement to make. Where? Because earthquakes kill millions of people all over the world. That's natural. Tsunamis drowned people all over the world. So, Hurricanes, uh, tornadoes. This is not, this is it's not all natural. Not Wait, good. Just, uh, where did the universe come out of? This is not a play of words. It's using language precisely. Can you repeat that? I can't understand. Uh, where that. did the universe come out of? My question is where not a play of words. Where did the universe come out of? This is, it's it's oh. language used quite I precisely. I think trying to ask the question, where did all this matter come from? Is that what you're trying to ask? Yeah, I mean, he said that, that it was meaningless, the question. It doesn't have content or the language wasn't precise. 
I'm just saying that the language is as precise as it can get in this context. I, I, I just can't hear what you're saying, all of what you're saying. Can you repeat that louder, the original Rishi? Question was, the original question was, uh, where did that creativity, in, 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 in the bigger picture of creativity, is that it, it comes out of nothing. Creativity it's comes out of nothing? Something is that what you're comes saying? out of nothing. Something comes out of nothing. That explains a greater paradigm. Something comes out of nothing. What's your question? Something comes out of nothing. I don't know what that means. That means nothing to us, I, you know? Yeah, so if, I, you, if you take a child and put him in a gray, empty ball and raise him, he'll come out as a drooling idiot. Because there's no stimulus. I, I think basically... Are you trying to talk about where, where matter comes from? I, I don't understand your question. Yeah, in a sense where matter comes from, I'm just saying uh, the approach to creativity if, with, given, with, with given factors is a limited approach to creativity. I'm just expanding the, the possibility of creativity which it, which it requires. No, I don't think they understand the question. So no, I don't understand the question. Is there a way you can rephrase the question which can help them understand what the question is? I see. In the meantime, we can... Just I think, I think know about it. Well, let's take another question. I, I think I know what he wants to know. How does the mind create new things? Isn't that what you really want to know? Okay, I'm going to try to answer it. He wants to know about the creation of the mind itself. What is mind? Is that what you want to know? What is it? I have to know what he wants to know. He's saying he wants to know how the mind is created, which is? Oh. How the mind is created. He's associated how, how the mind, with the universe sorry, itself. How the mind creates new things is the same process in some sense as how the mind is created itself. He's talking about how the mind creates new things is how the okay. mind is created itself. You want to know itself. how the mind makes new things. Is that what you want to know? I can't answer it unless you tell me that's what you want to know. If a kid is sitting on the beach, shoveling sand, and he sees a shell nearby, it doesn't take much to see that the shell can move sand easier than the hands. So he picks it up due to associative memory. That this, when he holds water in his hand, if it leaks out, he puts his fingers together. If he doesn't want the water to leak out, and he drinks it. When a coconut falls off the tree, it looks like that, but it doesn't leak. So he make, picks up a cup. Now, if the cup doesn't work, he puts a handle on it. But the handle is based on uh, experience of some kind. The more experience you have, if you work for Mercedes, Ford, General Motors, you have more knowledge about cars than you would have working for one company. The experience a child that. has, if you raise a child, on the many varying conditions, teach him how to draw, do clay modeling, carving, work machines. That child can bring more to an idea than the child that's never been exposed to anything like that. Yes, sir. That's a functional side of so creativity. The more you're exposed to, the more you have to work with. He says that's the functional side of creativity. Yeah, not the now, potential side of creativity. You still have an understanding. And... Some doctors go to Vienna to study surgery. Then they go to Germany, an area in Germany, to study eye diseases. And the doctor travels around and he picks up on, from information from all over the world. That's why they tell you, in order to become a good doctor, you want to study in Vienna, you want to study surgery here, and eye diseases there. So the more information you have, the more you can bring as solutions. Creativity doesn't just come from the ether. It doesn't come from nothing. It comes from your experience. Um, exact example Jacques usually gives is an Eskimo can't dream of walking on a palm fringe beach if he hasn't experienced it. You can experience things many different ways through nature. Where does experience come from? Experience means you walk through the woods and you sleep under a certain type of tree called manzanil. And the drops from that tree cause you to become blind for four or five days. So a guy remembers not to sleep under that tree. That's where experience comes from. It comes from your environment. 
from, from the books you read, the people you hang around with, the newspapers? Is, are there any other questions? Question. His question is, what happens if some resource runs out? I mean, you cannot be sure that resources will not run out. Well, and you cannot predict the future. You okay. cannot predict the future. That well, if resources run out, what do you do? That you is one. enough to go around. That is one. And Why don't we answer that one first? Let's just answer All right, that. Sure. Yeah. You want to answer it? What if you run out of resources? Yeah. I'll try to answer that. We blockaded Germany and we prevented them from getting rubber from Sumatra. But they had so many technicians in Germany, they invented synthetic rubber. So they have enough technicians to do a job. If we have more technicians rather than investment bankers, which can do nothing, politicians can do nothing, but if you have more research people, you can make substitute materials. It's happened all the time. We've done it continuously. You don't understand that? Rephrase your question. Any other questions, Harry? What do you answer? No, so his, he's saying, you cannot predict the future that you'll be able to come up with new resources. You can't do the future without resources? You cannot predict that you will be able to come up with another resource which is going to substitute the one that is running out. How can you predict this? How can you predict that you can come up with another um, substitute, substitute okay. in the future? How okay. can you predict Here's that? how you do that. First of all, you study all you can about a given subject. Say, uh, sometimes a person comes up to me and says, can you keep ice off airplane wings? You know, when it gets very cold and moist, you condense it on an airplane, it becomes too heavy to stay in the air. So they cover the leading edge of the wing with rubber. And when ice forms, they inflate it, deflate it, and that cracks the ice off. So that company came to me and said, can you keep ice off airplane wings in a better way? So I said, how far do you want to go? Because I don't know how far they want to go. So they said, how far can you go? I said, I can put a probe out in front of the airplane, a steel tube discharge electrons into the rain and then charge the leading edge with the same charge so water, this is in magazines I've done this, the water lands on the wing, then I turn on the current and the water lifts off the wing so no ice forms. And they said to me, how did you think of that? Well, I've been working with various types of electrical devices which give me more information. Then a guy from Paramount Pictures came up to me and he said, can you make 3D movies without glasses? You only have to wear glasses to see the 3D. And I said, it'll take about three weeks for me to make a test setup where you can see 3D without glasses. He said, how do you know you can do that? Because I can state the problem. What is 3D? What is stereoscopic vision? If you don't know what that is, you can't think about it. For example, if you cover one eye, try it. You can't tell me when these fingers are touching. Now take your hand away. You didn't see the depth. All you see is the two fingers. So it takes two eyes to see depth. You have to have define the terms. When you're doing research, if you don't know what the question is, you can't come up with the answer. Most people, when they say, what made life? They don't even know what life is. And they ask you, what made life? And they say, where did intellect come from? They have no reference for intellect. Intellect means associative memory, meaning you eat something and it burns you, the next time you see it, you don't bite it anymore. That's what associative memory is. The way the brain is linked. But they don't even know that. And they're asking, where did all this come from? Einstein said, I'd like to understand the mind of God. I said, how does a single cell multiply? He said, he didn't know. I said, forget about the mind of God. So, in some areas, Einstein was naive. In other areas, he was okay. So, people don't know what the question is. They say, how can you stop a killer? What's a killer? Isn't a soldier a killer? What do you mean by a killer? 
If a guy lives next door to you and he annoys the hell out of you for 10 years and one day you shoot him, the government gives you the chair or a life in prison. When the government gets mad at people, they send millions of people out there to kill them. They're all murderers and assassins. Don't you see that? There's no difference. Only they make movies showing Japanese as slanty-eyed bastards. Do you understand? And so when you call the Germans Krauts, they're not like people anymore. They're Krauts from sauerkraut. So here they very raise the soldiers, and they show Japanese attacking, raping women, killing them. The enlistment goes up 75% to call propaganda. And all nations use it, and they make killing machines of normal people, which is I'm very much against that, because I believe all people are perfectly well adjusted where they're coming from. I'll tell you one more story that might help you. A guy named Smiley worked for Al Capone, and he came up to me and he said, I want to know if there's anything wrong with me. I said, well, what makes you think there's anything wrong with you? I got two Rolls Royce, and I'd like to drive it to, this is his words, not mine, through nigger town, slowly, and watch those buggies look at me driving Rolls Royce. He says, why do I do that? Because you're that kid looking at the guy driving a Rolls Royce. He said, boy, if I had that, I'd drive slowly, and I'd like to be admired by all those people. You're that kid looking at the driving. That's where you get it from. But you're not born that way. He was born, he wasn't well educated, and after he learned to read the books I recommended for him, he no longer had those feelings. But he said to me, he lost all his friends as he couldn't talk to normal people anymore. The more you learn about real life, you won't be able to talk to normal people. If you still don't understand me, having children is a, an ideal that most people are brought up with. When you have a child, when it's very young, you have to wipe its behind, change its diapers, and then when they're four or five, they can't say anything interesting. They can say, lie, daddy, lie, 10 times, lie. Now, if, you, if that amuses you, you have a bank, neural bankruptcy. Having a child around for 10 years, you're going to hear nothing new. I can guarantee that, because they can't say anything new. They have no experience. So if a person brought up to want children, that society's impact, they want you to have children, so they'll have enough soldiers in the future to maintain their positions. Children are a pain in the ass. They, they deprive you from going out, but the future will offer you so many new options, you wouldn't want to wipe a kid's ass. You understand what I'm talking about? You go scuba diving, travel all over the world, you go back to school, learn what you want to learn. This way I can't get out, the kid's only three years old, I got to stay home. For what? When that kid's 18, he leaves you anyway. That is, if he does a good job. So, so you see, having children because I love two children, a boy and a girl. And what the hell do you want that for? If you really love children, think about this, you'd be around children a lot. You'd work with them. Why do you want your own? Your own children are no different than foreign children. If you still don't understand me, if you had a child 11 years old, and the hospital called you and said, they gave you the wrong baby, are you going to turn it in? Think about it. All children, very similar. They say the same kind of thing. Loving all children is what the answer is, not yours. I want Fresco's name to go on in the future. Well, that's the ego trip. There's nothing to do with loving kids. And love means to do things to enable those children to be better able to live and relate to other people, not just... Sometimes a guy comes up and he says, I have eight kids. And I say, what are they for? <laughs> what the hell is just having eight kids? If you don't try to make them wiser, smarter, better than you are, that's what it's about, not just having eight kids. I hope I've helped some of you. Okay. Thanks again for coming, but please talk to other people. The Venus Project is not about architecture. It's about a way of thinking. Is it perfect? No. It's a hell of a lot better than the crap you live in today.